Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on transformative feminist leadership in global health from rhetoric to action, which we are co-hosting with Creating Resources for Empowerment in Action, Kriya. A special thanks to Srilata Bhatliwala for her pioneering work on this particular issue. It's a great honor and privilege to have you with us today and looking forward to your remarks in a moment. Colleagues, as we reflect on why actions are not commensurate with global commitments to address gender equality in health, the power of leadership continues to stand out as a central enabler or barrier. But what is it about leadership that is holding us back? Widespread calls for gender parity have dominated the spotlight. However, we also recognize that we need to do more to move beyond quotas and that they are one step in a larger process of change that needs to happen, looking to set standards for leadership grounded on principles and values as opposed to a tick box exercise that begins to bring little change. Before I go forward, colleagues, let me pause for a moment and recognize the optics of me as a cis male opening this event on feminist leadership. I want to spend a minute reflecting on what feminist leadership means to me as an individual, but also to the Institute on Global Health that I represent as its new director. Thanks to the pioneering work of feminist organizations like CREA and others, we now have a deeper understanding of what we mean and understand by feminist leadership. At the heart of it all, however, is a reflection of our own power and privilege as individuals and institutions, and how we shift and share that power with others in our personal and work spaces. From decision-making to how we interact with each other, a feminist leadership approach for me requires to reflect on this every day and find new and better ways we create space and build leadership of each other. And this is why this dialogue is so critical. Last year, our institute led a major piece of work on what works in gender ill health in UN institution, which analyzed what works, where, why, how, and for whom with regards to successful gender integration, both programmatically and institutionally across five UN agencies, namely WHO, UNAIDS, UNFPA, UNDP, and UNICEF. Based on an analysis of 14 case studies, this work identified five key ingredients for success, one of which was power of leadership. Across all case studies, leadership support was fundamental in either catalyzing, accelerating, or sustaining positive changes that led to successful gender mainstreaming. Building on this piece, the Institute on Global Health launched a think piece and podcast series aiming to advance the discourse and critical analyses related to each of the five ingredients of success. We invite you to explore the existing pub published powers of think pieces and accompanying podcast series on our website, Power of Evidence, Power of Feminist, Civil Society, and the Power of Collective. Today marks the launch of the next think piece in the series authored by Srilata Bhatliwala on precisely this topic of transformative feminist leadership. IIGH has organized this event to open up very practical conversation with a fantastic group of panelists on a critical aspect that we all need to think about as we work towards advancing gender equality in health, naming moving beyond parity to transforming the nature of leadership. To move us along, I would like to introduce my colleague, Joanna Ria, who's a research fellow at the Institute on Global Health and has been leading the pieces of work on consolidating and synthesizing evidence on how to better integrate gender into health programming and policies. She's an epidemiologist with 10 years of experience in health policy, public health research, largely focusing on Africa. Over to you, Joanna. Thank you so much for that welcome, Rajat. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be moderating this panel. Um, a webinar in particular and panel discussion later. Um, 
And we have a fantastic group of experts who we're going to hear from, as Rajat has mentioned. And it's a real pleasure to be co-hosting this um, with Kriya. So thank you once again for that. Before we dive into the meat and really get into things, um, I do have a few housekeeping uh, points that I'd like to raise. Um, first of all, this is in webinar mode, but we really would like it to be interactive and we very much would like to hear from you. So do post your questions in the Q&A chat function. Um, the second point is that we want the conversation to continue via social media. So do use our Twitter handles at Gender Health Hub or the UNUIIGH Twitter handle as well at UNUIIGH. Um, the event is being live streamed. Um, so do share that link if any of your colleagues or friends couldn't join us or register in time. So now I have the pleasure of um, introducing Srilata. Uh, Srilata Batliwala, as Rajat has mentioned, um, has worked with CREA for some time. She's the Senior Advisor on Knowledge Building at CREA, also a Senior Associate at Gender at Work, and an Honorary Professor of Practice at SOAS University in London. And it has been a, a tremendous experience, I think, working with Srilata as she has written this think piece over the last few months. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be launching it today here as part of this webinar. And Srilata is now going to present a little bit about the think piece, talking us through what feminist leadership is and why it matters. So Srilata, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Johanna. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to ask all of you, especially the participants, to forgive me because I'm going to be running like an express train, but I hope that this is going to give you uh, a taste and sort of tantalize you to actually download and uh, read uh, the entire paper. So let's begin and I'm going to introduce you to the key concepts in the paper. So in the presentation, what I'm going to cover is what is transformative feminist leadership? How do we define it? Why does it matter? How is it different from other forms of leadership? What are the four Ps of the feminist leadership diamond? What gets in the way of practicing feminist leadership? And the four quadrants in which we have to create change in order to achieve this vision of transformative leadership. So without further ado, let's begin with the definition. How do we define feminist leadership? Now, this is a definition that's in progress and it, it keeps evolving and keeps deepening and changing as time goes on. So right now I'm defining it as a process of transforming ourselves. So beginning with the self, our organizations and the larger world to mirror and advance a feminist vision of social transformation and justice. So it's not about authority and control. It's not about who's the boss or even being the shiro or the savior but it's about dismantling discriminatory structures of power, whether they're visible, hidden or invisible within ourselves, our organizations and our movements and eventually the larger world. So the purpose of feminist leadership is to mobilize our individual and collective power to build a world of peace, equality, respect for nature and the planet, where the rights and well being of all people are ensured, regardless of all these differences and stigmas and exclusions that we've created. Why does this matter and how is it different? Now, to understand this better, we need to unpack what makes the feminist approach different, what makes that unique. So, the first thing that makes the feminist approach unique is that throughout history, there have been many ideologies of social justice preaching equality, but they all stopped outside the door of the household or family. 
and were content with achieve, achieving equality at that level. But feminism opened the door and analyzed how power is practiced in our most intimate spaces and relationships. It identified and interrogated all these hidden, invisible, and normalized power differences, discriminations, biases, and violence. So feminism is unique because it questioned power structures within our institutions, within our organizations, our relationships, and within ourselves, how we use our power. Most importantly, feminism was the first ideology to recognize our bodies and our sexuality as sites of power discrimination, control, and violence. So why is this approach to leadership therefore different? Because feminism believes that leadership is about leading for a larger purpose. It's about dismantling patriarchy, and all the other complex power structures through which it operates. So it's not about being the boss and exercising power and authority. It also means that feminist values and politics have to be reflected in all the spaces we occupy. And the think piece offers you some of the core values and principles that are critical to feminism. It's about bringing those values into all the roles we play, all the institutions we build, and that the power structure embedded within these has to get transformed alongside the process of our internal change. So to do this, we have to tackle the four Ps, which are what I call the feminist leadership diamond. So to practice feminist leadership in an authentic way, we have to balance the four Ps of power, principles, practice, politics, the purpose, and our practices. And it's only when we achieve a balance be between these four that leadership becomes transformative. So leadership becomes transformative when the practice of power the practice of power is mediated by and filtered through our principles and our purpose. What gets in the way? This sounds quite simple. It sounds pretty straightforward. Why can't we get it right? What are the challenges to the practice of feminist leadership? Here are some of the core challenges. First of all, we're working in institutions where so many biases have been normalized in the overt structure. Now, you know many of these. Sexism, you know, lower pay for women, even doing the same work, or women not getting access to certain roles in the organization, neocolonialism, racism, ageism, casteism, homophobia, a number of these biases. Then we have what we call the deep structure of our organizations. We'll see in a minute what those are about. Then we have the self. So in a sense, the self can almost become a barrier because our own, no matter what ideology we've embraced, our own histories, our experiences with power in our childhood or our early life, our social conditioning, the kind of privileges or power that we have internalized as you know, naturally owing to me and internalized sense of victimhood which is also what we call power under, which is the unhealed trauma that pushes us to use power in negative ways. So the role of the self is one of the biggest challenges in achieving a transformative practice of leadership because around, surrounding our practice of the four Ps is all this personal baggage, history, psychic baggage, our emotional health and ill health, our strengths and weaknesses, they all shape our practices. And these are some of the ways, some of the factors that are playing into how we conduct ourselves in a leadership role, even though our beliefs may be absolutely up there in the clouds. Now, what is power under? Because this is a big piece of the self that we often carry, and it's invisible even to us. Like, even we don't recognize that we've internalized these kinds of feelings. 
Power under is the term created by a psychoanalyst, Stephen Weinman, for when people who've suffered trauma or I added to it systemic oppression because of their caste, their gender, their you know, sexual expression, whatever. When people who have suffered this kind of trauma or systemic oppression become oppressive to others when they gain some kind of power. In organizations, power under is usually manifested as if I'm not on top, manipulation, subtle sabotage, gossip and backbiting to pull down somebody else and other behaviors which are a kind of victim power at work. And the basic premise of power under is, if I don't show who's the boss, I'll end up becoming the victim because there are only these two roles in the world, oppressor or victim. What are organizational deep structures? Well, these are the hidden and very subtle ways in which people often unconsciously reproduce or reenact social biases, hierarchies, non-transparent practices within organizational spaces, even if the organization's values are quite opposed to these. So on the surface, the organization looks perfect. It has this beautiful mission, value statement, uh, you know, great strategies, great policies, all the rest of it. But underneath, there is this bed of snakes because each of us is bringing into the organization all sorts of hidden baggage. And these are some of the common deep structure dynamics where the informal norms differ from the formal rules. So those who work late, those who work on weekends are more highly valued or more highly rewarded. There are all sorts of biases or sense of privilege that are reproduced in the organization. Like why should I have to wash up or why should I you know, clean a toilet or why should I do this work which I consider sort of secretarial. There's a lot of personal baggage and power under practices as we saw and some individuals or groups have greater power and influence in a very hidden informal way. Maybe it's the founding group or something like that. Am I getting out of time here? Certain kinds of behavior is rewarded and others is penalized. So to transform organizations, it's very useful to use the gender at work framework to look at how, what kinds of transformation we need to create in which quadrant. And the framework goes from the individual to the systemic or organizational level on the x-axis and from the informal to the formal on the y-axis. And each quarter, these are the things that we have to work on changing. On the formal side, resources, voice, control, access of individuals. On the systemic side, all the stuff around hierarchy, rules, roles, policies, etc. On the informal side, much tougher, internalized privilege, biases, unhealed trauma, and of course, all the deep structure stuff that's going on. Now, what is important to remember, and Johanna, I promise I'm finishing in the next 30 seconds. There is no perfect feminist organization. I know Bettina has heard me say this many times. And there is no one recipe or roadmap for every organization. There are many factors that are going to constrain our efforts, resources, legal and regulatory frameworks of the countries we work in, the demands of the work itself. Some I leave us with little time to address a lot of these issues. So our goal should be to try to become the next best version of ourselves, rather than sitting content and complacent that, oh, we can't change these things, you know, they're a normal part. We have to keep trying to become the next best version. So it's a challenging journey, but very well worth the struggle. And I wish you all good luck. Thank you, Johanna, back to you. Thank you so much, Sri Lata. And I think you've managed to capture so much in such a short time frame, um, but I do encourage the audience and everyone, please, you know, download Sri Lata's think piece. Spend time uh, reading through it, digesting a lot of this content, and I'm hopeful that the panel discussion that is following will also help um, put into practice a lot of these conceptual ideas that are so important for us to bring to life in our daily lives, you know, whether personally or professionally. 
Um, before we get to the panel discussion now, we do want to make this interactive. So we've uh, developed a Mentimeter and we'd like to ask everyone, the link is in uh, the chat box right now. The question is, in your organization, um, which quadrant, if you can remember the quadrants that Srilata presented, which quadrant needs to adopt feminist principles and action the most? So is it the informal, uh, you know, the self-informal spaces? Is it the systemic informal spaces? So some of, um, you know, the examples Srilata gave with regards to group jokes, perhaps, that are racist or sexist. Are there, uh, is there a space for improvement most in the self-formal spaces or the systemic formal? So we're seeing, I think everyone is slowly adding their answers. We'll give it a, a minute. Um, it's great to see it uh, interactive and as, as answers are coming in. And you can choose more than one, by the way. So do tick all that apply. Um, It's interesting, interesting to see, Joanna, that Please every comment, single Shilanda. time I've done this, every single time I've done this exercise, the winner in this poll is always the systemic informal stuff. Because huh? everyone knows it's there and it's going on and nobody knows what to do about it. So mm -hmm. thanks. And it's, it's so hard to change and where to begin. Um, and I hope, you know, through some of the examples that we'll hear in the panel discussion and the conversations that by the end of, of the webinar, at least some ideas would have been sparked um, with regards to begin to have, with regards to beginning to address some of these issues. So a few more. Okay. And we'll see. I mean, as everyone hopefully can see on the screen, um, the sort of quadrant with the least space or need for, for application of feminist principles is the self-formal, and the most is um, the upper quadrant, which is the systemic informal spaces. Um, followed very closely, I think, I mean, 15 and 12. So the self-informal really being reflexive about our own power, our own privilege, how we behave within the organizations and treat others. Um, and then followed by more of the systemic formal uh, policies perhaps, or, or guidelines that can be implemented within the organization. So now we'll dive into the panel discussion. We've packed a lot in. I feel like we've been moving quite quickly through this webinar, um, but I have the pleasure to introduce a fantastic group of panelists that have agreed to join us today in a very practical conversation with regards to how we can implement feminist principles and feminist values in health organizations and drawing on the lessons and experiences that they've had. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce each of them in turn before we dive into the discussion. I am giving very, very short introductions to allow space, more space for dialogue and conversation, but their full bios are available and will be popping up in the chat. So um, please have a read through them as well. The first panelist I'd like to introduce is Rudo Chigudu. She's a Zimbabwean feminist, activist, and artist. I have not forgotten Rudo. Um, and she's currently the board member of Zimbabwe's Women's Resource Center and Network. I don't know if we're spotlighting. Are we spotlighting people? Sorry, I can see myself. I hope, I hope you've seen Rudo and, and she's waved. Our next panelist is Gegan Seti, who's the founder of Janvikas and board member of Oxfam India. Um, the third panelist is Lucy Kombe, who is a young feminist joining us from Kenya. She's a women's rights advocate and also the program assistant at Zamara Foundation based in Kenya. And finally, we have Bettina Baldeski, who's the CEO of the International Women's Development Agency in Australia. So welcome everyone. Um, it's been such a pleasure, I think, to hear some of the background conversations that were happening um, prior to the start of the webinar. But I wanted to, to kick off really sticking with this theme of the quadrants that Srilata presented and we re made reference to in the Mentimeter poll. I'd like to hear from each of you if you could talk to a very practical lived example 
you know, that, that you've experienced in terms of being uh, able to implement transformational feminist principles and practices, making reference to one of the four quadrants. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what was the problem that you identified? What were some of the steps that you took to try to address this problem? And then conclude with, you know, an overview of some of the changes you've seen or perhaps hope to see as a result of some of those actions. Rudo, can I ask you to, to kick us off? Thank you, Joanna. Um, so I think I come to my experience in a sort of roundabout way. Um, it feels almost as though the formal institutional movement based stuff um, led me to the self um, informal space. So it, also, it almost comes, so my example comes from an institutional space, um, but how it led me to the self informal. Um, I think my experience comes from what was pain and trauma in feminist space that I think in our organizing, in our thinking, are the spaces of safety, right? So we, we are in, in feminist spaces because these are the spaces that transform lives, that support us, that hold us, that anchor us. They are the starting points for what we want to see in the world. Um, and then being part of a collective that was truly trying um, to do this in the world, we came together as a group of young um, feminists, driven, passionate, inspired. We thought we could change the world. Um, but in the process, who we were as individuals um, came up in really strong and distinct ways. So I won't dwell on the story, it could take us all day. Um, but I think the lesson was that at a time when we were thinking at our sharpest, most creative, most energetic, um, the pain that we carried, whether it was from childhood or past experience, um, those traumas, those ways of seeing ourselves, the ways in which we had been told we had value or had been devalued um, in our lives really started to surface. So very personal insecurities um, began to surface. And it was almost as though we were flowing uh, at each other, right? So you're in a space, you're part of the same collective but when the collective is talked about whose name gets mentioned, whose name gets mentioned first, uh, who's getting credit for the work that the movement, the collective is doing. Um, and so in these ways where donors, other organizations, other folks who were really excited about the work that was happening, um, were trying to magnify, amplify what it is we were doing, they were also magnifying the tensions amongst us. Um, and almost dividing. So it was just in those moments where we started to feel like, why is it your name um, that comes up uh, and not mine? What do you say when the others are not present? Um, who has access and safety? We're part of a collective movement, but if things go wrong um, and we are attacked or under attack in Zimbabwe, where, yeah, in a very repressive um context, especially around issues of LGBTI and abortion, um, if things really go wrong, your name is known and you can be carried away by amnesty or frontline, what happens to the rest of us in the movement. So for me, it was really just these, um, they seemed small, <laughs> subtle, but were massive, massive uh, fractures in, in, in the movement. And so for me, rather than when I was reflecting, and so part of that was, okay, I need to step away because this is increasingly becoming unhealthy for the work that, that it is we are trying to do. So maybe the best thing for me to do is step away from this. Um, but in stepping away, I needed to stop and reflect. We started off so close. We were friends, sisters, comrades, as we did this work. How did we get to this place? Um, and so for me, it was, it was having to pause and say, in the moments when I was challenged, what was triggered in me? Um, when my idea was not the best idea, <laughs> um, why was that hard for me to accept? And similarly, um, looking at my, my sisters, my colleagues saying, 
asking the same questions. So rather than say they were horrible, they were bad, they were, um, or I was horrible, I was bad, I was, it was really saying what are the underlying factors? Where is the pain? Where was the eight-year-old me who wasn't picked first? <laughs> when, when were they surfacing in those moments? Um, and so I just decided it was important, essential, if I was going to do the work that I thought mattered, to spend the time facing myself, facing Rudo, <laughs> because Rudo was going to go back into the world, even if I was not going back into that organization, that collective, I was going to go back into the world. And I needed. I needed to heal me. I needed to understand me. I needed to hold me, hug me, love me. <laughs> um, and I needed to challenge myself. And a lot of that came from building systems of accountability around myself, where I said, I cannot trust myself that in every moment where I am challenged, questioned, triggered, um, that this, yeah, this pained part of me won't surface. So how do I build community with people around me that I trust to love me and hold me and check me? <laughs> um, and, that's, and that's really what I needed. People who, whose love I could trust, but whose honesty, brutal honesty when it was needed, I could trust. And so for me, that was the system of um, holding myself. Um, and I think the most challenging thing was that, really having to face myself um, and having people say to me, you can withdraw, but you take Rudo with you wherever it is that you go. So it doesn't matter what the space is, you carry yourself, whatever space you end up in. And so until you are able to spend that time, um, you know, what, what, um, you can't shift, you can't transform. And similarly for me, that has been the engineering force whenever I think about the people around me, organizations, movements, states, you know, whoever it is that feels like they're against what it is we're trying to do. And I say they are carrying the same pain, the same trauma, the same insecurities, um, privilege, whatever it is, they're carrying it in them. Um, and if we really want them to transform or if we really hope for that kind of transformation, how do we get to the individual being? Um, so for me, I call self-awareness my obsession. <laughs> Um, and that is my anchor, really just taking the time on the daily to intentionally say, what was that feeling that arose in that moment? Even if I didn't verbalize it, even if I didn't react negatively or badly, if there's a feeling that arises in me, can I take my attention to that feeling and ask myself, what is the driving force of that? Um, and so I think when I think about who we want to be in the world, I keep thinking the more self-aware we can be, um, then, you know, the better our chances <laughs> of truly transforming self and becoming what it is that we, we say we want to, to, to see in the world. So I'll stop there because I could talk forever. I'm known for that, <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's where I come from. No, thank you for such a powerful um, example, Rudo. I think kicking us off, you know, really, um, yeah, it, it is personal. The political is personal on a daily basis. And I think your, your example, you know, has been very vulnerable. And I think it's, it's great to have you willing and comfortable to share that with the audience, because I think these are some of the difficult conversations that, you know, we all struggle to admit that we have these feelings and we, we react in these ways, but that uh, realization that we need to check ourselves, we need to, to take a moment, as you've said, to really think through why we've had that initial thought or reaction and how do we, um, and I like this term you used, develop these systems of accountability to oneself, right? that are so important to do. But what can we do to create space and time? Because to allow for that level of reflection and self-awareness to be built in, like you're saying, as a daily practice, we need to be to create that time to allow ourselves to do that. So I think it would be good to think about, you know, the audience as well, please put your questions or comments in the Q&A. But I think thinking about what, what what space can we create to allow that 
um, self self reflection piece um, for this process of transformation. So thanks, Rudo. I'll I'll move on and ask um, Gagan, please, if you can share your your example, and then we'll move around and mm -hmm. depending on time, see if we have one more question or we move to Q and A. No, no, thank you um, so much, Johanna. Um, and, you know, uh, Rudo just actually uh, rings a bell and connects with something which you just said. To me, um, it's for me, for me, it's breaking what I call the shackle of the deficit. Um, and therefore, it is a function of how do you break it through time, space and skills. And I'm really talking, whenever this example comes, there is a, a woman called P, um, and I don't use her full name because she still works with me. Um, you know, joined as a small as an office girl um, in our one of our law centers in a district which has about a 1.5 million population. And there were two senior Dalit lawyers who were working there, and they were constantly fighting. Um, and you know, there were many other paralegals, etc., working with them with them. And I used to keep going there for conflict resolution sessions and, you know, things would just not move. And one day I was just exasperated and said, we need to close down this center. This girl, she's an acid victim or a survivor with half a face fully burnt down. Was She became angry and said, this center is not meant for them. This is meant for women like me. And if these guys are going to be fighting, throw them out and I will run the center. And I was just taken aback by the, just the power of the anger, but also the purpose which she had so sort of internalized. And it was a big risk. And I said, okay, both of them go. How will you run it? And she said, I don't know how. You'll have to help me but I'll run this center, this center can't close down. Today, she runs that center. She runs and she's part of the district committee. She sorts out rape and cases by the dozen every month. And she sort of hires lawyers. Uh, she's trained herself. For me, the cycle of giving, the moment she give space, and I think it, it's somewhere in the mind you break the shackle of the deficit. It's largely through anger. Um, I'm saying this because I've seen it again and again, but even in the third quadrant or the fourth quadrant, you know, 2002 for me has been a watershed um, in terms of the of the riots in, in Gujarat from where I come. And, you know, in a sense, it created a sense where that men cannot protect the women especially the Muslim women. And I think it changed the very nature of how Muslim women see themselves. Today, we have a non-traditional livelihood program and there are about 100 Muslim women who have become drivers, uh, taxi drivers. There are about 100 women who become, you know, what we call general duty assistants in health. But it's a collective space, they say, we need to protect ourselves. We need to claim spaces out there. So they will wear their burqas, but they will drive, they will learn. I think it's for me, um, this, this thing of culture and breaking the culture um, to, to really reach the fourth thing, it has to be a movement. Um, and so for me, this triad, that you can start with skills, you can start with space, you can start with time, but you need to cover the three spaces. And through that process, you move from what Sri Lata always says, and I love her for, to move from quadrant one to three to two to four. Uh, how does it become a movement? Um, does it all connect together? Whether all groups come together? And what is the role of men in this? Do we really, really are wanting to control or do we really want to look at co-construction together? These have been some of the challenges, but it's been a very beautiful experience seeing the, the power of anger, the power of handling fear, collectively unbundling the fear and dealing with it. 
I think once those you give that space, there is a whole transformative process happening. It needs, and I fully agree with Sri Lata, it's always work in progress. There is nothing about having arrived there. Um, yet, I think we have still a long way to go, especially in a society like India, where we, where we are seeing a retrograde process going on. Uh, but still, the hope lies in these transformative processes. I'll shut up. No, not at all. I actually wanted to pick up on, on your point with regards to you know, the role of men. Um, but as we think from the global health space, I know there's a lot of talk, I mean, more generally in society in terms of parity and it being you know, often seen as, as a, an end goal in itself, whereas actually it's, it's one step in a, in a much longer process of change that needs to happen. Um, and how do we build those bridges with, with those people who are reacting or responding in more oppressive ways or, you know, restraining and not allowing those who, who do have this, uh, you know, who do have the will to change things and, and, and energy to do so and provide them that space. So, yeah, maybe we can come back. Yeah, um, yeah but just one liner, Johanna, yeah. I, I just think, I just think, I mean, as a man, um, if I don't see the need to humanize myself to become human um, and how women can actually help me become a human being and I seek that help, um, I think the relationship always remains a power relationship. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Lucy, please. Um, can you talk us through your example? Thank you very much, Johanna. Um, and for me, I'll, I'll really expound on what um, my colleague, um, or rather Gagan has al already alluded to in terms of the systemic formal, uh, which did not have so many um, feedback when we had, we had the Mintimeter. But really, just to paint a picture of what the context is uh, from where we're coming from, because we believe that the systems around us also impact how uh, the leadership within the organizations or within the institution is also uh, responsive to this. So within the society we live in is very uh, Christian-based as well as uh, a strong uh, opposition and anti-gender um, movement that really... Uh, keeps on and um, give, gives us a more and more oppressive and limitation, especially when it comes to even organizational leadership. And with this, we, we as Zamara Foundation, we acknowledge that um, through, this, through this work that we do and through the systems that we build uh, within our, our structures, um, it really speaks to what now, um, that we acknowledge that they, they are, there's already an existing um, uh, effort towards now curbing or uh, or responding to these oppressions and to these limitations. And with this, we acknowledge that um, the girl, the the adolescent or the constituents that we we tend to target, or the the constituents that we we work with, even with the staff members uh, at the organization, is to really um, acknowledge that and recognize that there is an inherent power uh, within them within themselves uh, to actually make uh, or even um, uh, contribute towards the efforts of. Um, challenging these oppressive uh, structures and systems uh, even outside um, our organizational uh, level. And with this, um, I think we have been very intentional uh, as an organization that is very, very young uh, in, in terms of even drafting our policies, our structures, and very intentionally even in our leadership uh, to, 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 to include and to to engrave uh, these feminist principles and values in, in, in each and every intervention, in each and every um, uh, role, and uh, even the, the the responsiveness of these uh, these issues we are facing, um, and we have been walking the talk uh, in terms of now 
within the institution uh, structuring and policies um, that recognizes and acknowledges that um, the young people are, are we're working with young feminists and girls who have also a potential of uh, bringing the, the, their, their contribution and their power that is not often um, recognized uh, by by most of the organizations uh, so we are we acknowledge that the the young women young feminist leaders the girls the adolescent girls we work with are actually um a very resource um when it comes to now building uh solidarity and raising consciousness um through the dialogues we are having and creating the safe space as we are, as was alluded to the with the previous speaker. Um, and with this, we acknowledge and uh, with the opportunities that we create for them to actually uh, exercise their power and exercise their leadership uh, through the different ways. Like the recently uh, a, a, case in, a case in study for us, uh, I would speak about the, the feminist, uh, Intersectional Feminist Leadership Institute that we recently launched. And with this, it has really provided a platform for us to, to enable, further enable these young women, these staff members of the organization to actually uh, um, broaden their, their expertise and even acknowledge and recognize that they actually have the power within themselves to, to do this and to lead in their various ways and creative ways um, to bring out the change that we all want to see within the organization as well as uh, even outside with our interventions. And with this, we we also recognize and um, with the efforts, uh, we value the opportunities of the of the of the partnerships and collaborations that are also bringing on board the the, diff, the shared vision and solidarity as well as uh, deliberate. Um, inclusivity of the language, um, even in, in, in simple survey or gender sensitive uh, tools that we roll out to ensure that the language is inclusive of gender expansive persons. And um, with this, um, we've had a lot of uh, different outcomes that have really contributed towards the success of the different uh, pro projects as well as the structure itself. Um, one of them being the, the shared vision, where we, we, we now see that there's a shared vision across the board with the staff members within the organization, as well as the constituents that you're working with, uh, who have now a passion in what we are, we, the agenda that we, we are bringing on board in terms of now dismantling these patriarchal systems as well as now building the solidarity in the space uh, to know that there's always support uh, when it comes to now um, speaking about the issue as well as uh, responding to these issues. Secondly, is the build of the positive relationships that um, and the rapport that uh, we have within the organization as well as with our constituents. Uh, among us now the staff members to the constituents of the adolescent girls, young women and gender expansive persons. Also, there's a critical uh, mass of these constituents who are now um, uh, able to take up leadership roles and also push for the advancement of the women's rights in general. Um, maybe just uh, to, to, to give a, a clear uh, a picture of what the organization's uh, manifesto is all about. Uh, we believe that uh, as Zamara Foundation, as much as we are a small organization, we believe that we are a space uh, where we where we can dare to dream, uh, where we feel seen, heard, loved, and cared for, where it's a place where we live enriched, uh, but also a place we enrich, uh, a space of mutual respect and one that acknowledges uh, what one comes with uh, that also speaks about the inherent power. Uh, we also, uh, it's also a place of, that gathers us all uh, and builds the solidarity, a place that reminds us of our power, our strength, especially when it comes to the 
unified voice and togetherness in the efforts that we we tend to put out there to uh, dismantle these patriarchal systems and structures. Uh, we also uh, we are also a space where. Uh, those my, those who are at the margins uh, are centered, and that's where we talk about the inclusive inclusivity in our languages, in our structures, uh, to be intentional and deliberate to in the language itself, uh, to include things like pronouns in surveys and gender sensitive um, tools. Um, we also uh, a place where we become and unbecome and where we can be ourselves and our authentic selves. So those are our, our manifestos that we could develop with some of these um, constituents of young women, gender expansive people. And we are de very deliberate in ensuring that all through our work, we are meaningfully engaging um, this constituent to ensure that these uh, approaches, these structures, these policies within the system are responsive to the needs of these um, constituents. Well, um, I'll speak on the Lucy, challenges that, yeah. Lucy, I'm very conscious of time. I wonder yeah. if we can pause because we have 10 more minutes roughly for the end of mm -hmm. this panel discussion before we open it up. And I want yeah. to give Bettina just the chance and then we can we can loop back around maybe and, and pick on some of the challenges and Thank also um, follow up. I think, you know, I have questions with regards to some of the things you've said already. I apologize for having to be a slightly firm moderator. Um, so Bettina, please, in the interest of time. Thank you. Um, so I'll take a storytelling approach, uh, and actually I want to try and travel through the four quadrants, uh, starting with the uh, informal and, and the individual, so starting uh, actually with me. And so uh, it's a, no a story of organizational change, which is ongoing. We have talked to, we've heard this as a, as a theme from uh, other panelists. So context, uh, we are a feminist organization of about 55 plus women. And back uh, about two years ago, some, uh, and you know, I'm making myself completely vulnerable in sharing this. About two years ago, some allegation of racism were made against the organization on Instagram by what looked like uh, previous uh, staff from IWDA and actually uh, staff from IWDA came forward at that time and also uh, expressed that they had experienced racism in the organization. So my journey as a CEO in this moment is I went to, um, you know, with complete, uh, I guess, privilege and biases, I went to what, what does uh, a CEO response looks like? And it looks, it looks like, uh, in my head, mitigating risk, understanding evidence, so a very cognitive sort of response. And uh, you can you can see that response is not landing. It's not working. Where we are completely missing each other. And I I have this moment I really recollect vividly. And I tried to cut the story short so I can move to the quadrant. But I remember vividly a moment of being into a workshop which was a First Nation workshop. And a First Nation person says, "White people need to stop thinking with their head and they need to start listening with their heart." That was my first light bulb moment because in that moment, I really had a real sense of, oh my goodness, I have not actually stopped and listened to what is happening through my heart. I have given uh, and I am giving and engaging with this through uh, a sort of head response with all of my privileges, all of my uh, biases. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going through this with lived experience. I'm not seeking lived experience. I'm not listening with my heart. The second light bulb moment for me uh, was around understanding that as an organization that's focused on gender equality, a feminist organization, we have gender equality fluency. If someone had come towards us to say they had experienced sexual harassment in the organization, we had a, would have taken a very different approach, which would have been one of first believing. So why is it different in this instance? And so from there, I moved to the other quadrant, which is the quadrant of still the informal, but the systemic, which is how does that conversation then unfold in an organization where you have women of color and white women 
and all of those assumptions and biases are suddenly coming together and people are looking for a response and are looking for an apology. And again, you can see in that moment that invisible power, uh, everything to do with deep structure plays out and tend to push us as a global North organization, which has predominantly white women in the organization, down the path of an apology is about risk mitigation. It's about acknowledging wrongdoing, but as almost like a closure moment. Um, whereas in fact, actually, again, taking an approach of deep listening, of really actually opening discomfort, creating the space where we can sit with the discomfort of hearing, the apology becomes a first um, step. It becomes the start of healing. And so we're starting on a very different frame, a very different um, sort of conversations. So which leads to you know, those questions of power that Shuleta touched on, who's setting the frame, who's asking the question, who's holding the space, who's holding the pen. So for us at AWDA, still moving through those quadrants, we actually work through this apology uh, in a way that actually it took a long time to get to, to an apology, which was actually participatory in terms of having the voices across the organization in that document that actually became a statement of intention for the organization to become explicitly an anti-racist organization. And so from that, you move to the next quadrant around the systemic and the formal, and that looks like transformation at governance level. So our board um, has now, half of the board is now made of uh, women of color with lived experience from the region where we work. Uh, we have a co-chair model with one of the co-chair being a woman of color with lived experience from the region, changes into our leadership team. And I hope that my succession will look like a co CMO model with maybe two women of color or at least one. Um, something else that's systemic and formal that's useful to share because it's practical example and you've asked for practical example of what feminist leadership and tangible change looks like is doing a scan across our contracts in the organization and really realizing that we have unintentionally, but that's not good enough, unintentionally reproduced systemic racism because most of the white women are on permanent contract and most of the women are on short-term contract. So um, changing this kind of uh, you know, deep organizational um, structures which are about policies and rules do not come about, I think, unless there is that individual self-reflective and wellness moment that can be transpiring into a collective self-awareness moment, which then we can actually try to bed into systems and structure and to finish the, side, the, the circle and come to the last quadrant around the individual and the formal. For me, as a CEO of the organization, that means what does then structured learning and unlearning looks like? So it looks like, for example, setting up a formal structure for myself of coaching and mentoring by women of color with lived experience who bring very different uh, perspective and therefore through that process are uh, questioning my biases, are uh, questioning my privilege, are uh, questioning the way I come to um, know, think, feel the world. Um, so I'm looking at the time, I'm gonna pause there. I wanted to take a really practical example that shows some vulnerability, which I think is one of the feminine principle and actually talk it through each of the quadrants. Thank you so much, Bettina. And I think it, it is nice to see, you know, although I'd presented it sort of as the quadrants, actually they are interlinked. And you know, it's important to consider the actions that are needed across these quadrants um, and, and efforts that can be made. But I think your point that the starting place is really the self. And I think it sort of brings us looping back to Rudo's opening example that if that, if that self-awareness is not there, it's very hard to then move to change some of these other um, quadrants. Srilata, please come in. We'll have no. Just more just a quick yeah. uh, just a quick comment to build on uh, Bettina's sharing of this. You know, very uh, vibrant and ongoing experiment they've been in 
is also to remember that if you make a change in one quadrant, it doesn't necessarily or automatically flow into the others. Sometimes it, what you do in one quadrant immediately impacts others and sometimes it doesn't. So for instance, I've seen boards where they've changed their composition in terms of say, color, nationality, gender, et cetera. And then it just stays there with say the white men doing all the talking and the other people feeling sort of disempowered in that space because the culture of that space hasn't been interrogated. And sometimes that has to be reconstructed, that has to be tackled. And as you said, we have to work on what's holding these people back. So just giving me, it's like, you know, getting women into politics doesn't mean they're gonna get up there and really, you know, make their presence felt. Sometimes those spaces are very alienating. And the, the other factor I just wanted to flag is, there are also a lot of cultural constraints here. You know, how we are brought up in different cultures. I know my African sisters would very much agree with me on this, that we are brought up in cultures of deference to older people, deference to people in positions of authority. These are very hard things to shake off, you know. So we can't assume that, oh, we changed this. We've, you know, recomposed our board. Therefore, now you know, the whole culture of the board functioning is going to change. It doesn't happen. Sorry. I, uh, I fully agree. And I think that is the difference between representation and inclusion for me. Um, so maybe that we will discuss further. But um, yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause here. I think we are definitely going to continue a number of these conversations and threads. Um, we do have one more Mentimeter um, set up, which I think we would like to ask and hear from the audience again. I'm, I mean, some questions have been coming through. Please ask more. The Mentimeter is the link to the Mentimeter is in the chat. Um, and the question is, what is one word you would use to describe the way you use your own power? So thinking about it as oneself at work. And try to be honest. Um, So we have words like fairness, transform, an enabler, self-aware, subtle, intentional, or doing it, having power intentionally, um, a patient listener. Supportive. Gosh, they're growing now. It's it's becoming harder. <laughs> Ones that are based on 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 mentorship, accessibility, caring, um, vulnerable, giving space, collaborative. I mean, these are all very positive. Um, and I mean, not to suggest that, you know, we are otherwise, but I think it's important to think, think about how we are using it. Um, and it would be interesting to see how others perceive us then. Um, and making that link. Okay, we'll keep, <laughs> um, we'll keep, keep the conversations going. And yeah, uh, Gagan has, has said we should encourage some dissent. So um, in terms of, of questions, I wanted to, to draw on a few things that were said. Um, but also tie in, you know, some of the questions that have come in from the audience. And, and the first one um, is really to do with this uh, handling, um, handling oppressive behavior or structures within an organization, recognizing that they do stem from, you know, um, either past traumas or, you know, other, other underlying issues. How, how can we humanize them, recognizing their limitations, but at the same time, not give them a pass? So how do we call them out? What are the ways that can, that you know, individuals can use, whether it's a particular policy or approaching an individual within the organization, 
from a space of wanting to grow and develop and and become a better a better more just more fair organization so if i can ask um i was going to ask rudo and bettina maybe to quickly reflect on on that point so how do we humanize as opposed to just demonize but at the same time not not give a pass to that sort of behavior um I'll, I'll go. Uh, I think one of the things that comes up for me is the ways um, of affirming um, that sort of open up space for checking. So I think one of the things was really thinking about like what are the gems in an individual, individuals within the collective. So when we think about an organization, a movement, whatever, what is it that someone is great at? Um, but then also being able to visibilize. So I'll use an example. It's like two sides of a coin. My creativity is also my disorganization. Um, and so the recognition that if you create, you love it when someone is creative and they generate ideas, but that also means they can float, right, and drift in ways that the structured technicians don't want in the same way someone's highly organized uh, nature, which we love because it keeps us on track and focused, is also their rigidity, inflexibility, failure to adapt. So there's this way of, can we spend time recognizing the gems in ourselves? Um, but not just as one side of a coin, but as the flip side. So when someone is being rigid, you say, okay, we actually understand that it's this structured mindset of yours that's at play. But in this moment, this is what we need. Um, same thing with the creativity we love. You don't want to kill the vibrance of people. You don't want to kill the things that are actually beautiful, incredible about the people in your team. Um, if we were all the same human, <laughs> we wouldn't need teams, right? One person could just do it all. But the beauty of it is we actually come in this beautiful diversity, but when we enter institutions, we are really trying to make one person out of everyone, be structured, be creative, be organized, be, and it's just, <laughs> it won't work, can't work. Um, so I think there's something for me in there about affirming what is beautiful and recognizing what the flip side of that is. So that even when we are critiquing it, it's not in isolation of, you know, the beautiful, the gem that is within that person or that action or that situation. Um, yeah, so for me, that's the thing. We don't give it a pass, but we recognize that, you know, it's not what's needed just in this moment. That's what comes up for me. Thanks, Rudo. Bettina? Oh, it's a beautiful what uh, Rudo has just said. I think it's really inspiring. Um, I think for us in the organization, so there's definitely echoing some of what Rudo is saying. Um, what we have really worked on is try, trying to embrace discomfort. So a, a lot of the changes in the kind of work that we've just talked about which, you know, is ongoing and, uh, and continues to have failings. But that's, that's the point, is actually being able to create the space where we can talk about the failings, where we can call each other in on the failings and, on the, and you know, we very practical things where sometimes we have silence and we are giving ourselves permission to sit into that silence and recognizing that actually the person who wants to speak is probably just really not dealing with the discomfort and, and, we actually, and needs to refrain. So I think really naming discomfort, knowing that spaces of discomfort are actually often places of growth, but creating enough trust and safety for us to know that we are then growing together. Um, that's become a really key element of building trust amongst that uh, amongst the team. Thank you. And I think, yeah, both very practical examples that we can implement, you know, in in our day to day lives. Srilata, please jump in. No, 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 you're on mute. Hang on. Sorry. 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 Uh, I, I love what Rudo said but I wanted to nuance it because I wanted to share 
that in uh, one of the organizations I work in, what I have witnessed is that a lot of people say on the creative side, say in communications or in the program side, they want this for themselves, you know, but they are not. And this is, again, a very unconscious, deep structure dynamic I've noticed. They are not very loving or appreciative of what finance does, what accounts does, of the people who report to the donors and keep the money flowing, honey, so that you can work. Okay. I don't see the appreciation flowing in that. So they are always asking for this kind of, you know, space and uh, patience and acceptance of different rhythms of work from others towards themselves. But I don't see it flowing towards those who sadly have to meet deadlines, deal with donors, send reports, et cetera. So I found an interesting thing that uh, another organization I've worked with in a sort of facilitating capacity has done, which is they've created a sort of a norms of engagement, a set of principles. And that's quite interesting because in that they've tried to accommodate, you know, these different rhythms of work, et cetera, but they've agreed to certain boundaries where, okay, this has to be done by this date. So you get this much time, but then you have to deliver by then. Then you can't say, oh, you know, I wasn't in the mood and stuff like that. So it's interesting how people are trying to deal with these different rhythms and the kinds of spaces that people need that are so different. Thank you. Thank you, Srilata. And I'm just thinking, you know, from a sort of global health lens, if we're thinking about global health organizations, um, how do we how do we implement this? You know, there, there are those that work in slightly the more creative space in terms of communications and communicating the, the global health messages to various audiences. But you do have also in most organizations, the administrative team that plays such a critical role, um, but approach things very differently. And how do we ensure that all of those groups are valued, are recognized, um, are appreciated, and find, like you say, Shulata, a rhythm, a way of working together that that can um, play on play on those strengths. Okay, Ruda, I'll hand over, and then I will jump on to the next question. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to raise my hand, but it's fine. I think the thing that I'll just uh, reinforce is the is what already was mentioned around cultures. Um, that you are building an institutional and organizational culture that creates that space. So rather than it being the initiative of someone who wants or needs specific accommodations, it's across the organization. Um, and so you actually have a sense in agreement that when we get too drifty as the dreamers, these are the ways, right, in which you bring us back. And when we get too rigid, um, these are the ways in which we need the creativity. And so it's really about embedding organizational culture, not waiting for, because not everyone um, will ask for what it is that they need as accommodation, um, but it's really integrating into the organization these ways of being so that across the board, um, the different needs and ways of being um, are recognized and accommodated. Okay, and I see there are also questions coming in. Sorry, Rudo, thank you. I'm, I'm just reading the, the chat messages as well. Um, we have a couple of questions that we could group together and maybe I'll ask uh, Gagan and Lucy to answer and respond and then others can chip in time allowing. Um, one of them is from Mark and he asks, in a culture um, where those who are oppressed, dehumanized and disempowered when they really start to speak out, um, they're often called either leftists or troublemakers, and how do we bridge these gaps? And I think there was a similar sort of themed question, I guess, um, which came in uh, around the backlash against feminism and what it means to be a feminist. Um, in the public space, there really seems to be a misunderstanding of what feminist feminism is and being a feminist is. 
Um, so the question is how could we promote feminist leadership or change this perception so that it's something that organizations are more willing to embrace. So. Uh, Johanna, if I could say it very simply, for me, it is inversion of roles as what is more important and what is more powerful in social change. And for me, the, the word frontline worker, especially in health, has come only after the COVID. Till then, it was they were the last in the chain. Uh, so from last to first, uh, this is when COVID happens, the whole system realizes that it's not the multi-speciality research which changes the world, but it's that first line worker which does. And I think an organization having to realize that those nearest to the fire are the most important in sort of telling us what's really happening. The rest have to learn to listen uh, more than tell. However, in the transactional nature of our organization, which follows managerial uh, data and all that, uh, I think we are converting our frontline leadership into just implementers of somebody's ideas. And that doesn't work. And it's high time, um, especially development professionals, and specifically health and other uh, interventions, realize that if we don't give the time, space, and skills to the first line, front line, no change is ever going to happen. Uh, I think in taking Sri Lata as this thing, are we really aligned to our purpose or are we only uh, using the purpose as cosmetic? Uh, I think these are questions which I keep asking myself and I keep asking people whom I work with. Thank you, Gagan. And Lucy, please. Yep. Um, so maybe just to anchor or to just um, echo as well in terms of now um, positioning and uh, modeling uh, the feminist principles and values uh, in each and every uh, interventions that we do. And this will be, this can be uh, manifested or can be seen in things like communication. How do we communicate? How do we, um, how, we how are we consistent in uh, being the, 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 the organization that speaks about or, or rather challenges or oppress, oppressive systems and structures? Uh, and through this messaging and through this communication and through this consistency in modeling uh, and even mentoring uh, the young uh, feminist uh, collectives that are not even registered, their loose networks, and recognizing other marginalized groups like the sex workers, young mothers, and bringing them on board and ensuring that there's a collective voice and a kind of a movement building uh, both online and offline in efforts to counter, monitor, uh, some of this backlash, some of these uh, uh, oppositions that we are facing as feminists, uh, and in this we we are we we will be building and. Um, influencing the positive narrative uh, of what feminism is all about uh, at both community level as well as other uh, um, spaces that we seek to influence. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Does anyone else briefly want to come in? I do want to give everyone the space to give sort of a one minute wrap up um, statement before we end the panel discussion. More questions are coming in as always. We wish we had more time, um, but I do hope you will reach out either to the panelists, but also read Sri Lata's think piece. There are extensive resources at the end of it um, that are really helpful and speak to many of the issues that have that have come up in the in the discussion. Um, any other burning comments or, or reactions to that last question? Or should we move to final closing remarks? One, one thing you'd like to leave the audience with, um, given the discussions we've had today. So we'll start sort of looping back, um, uh, Lucy maybe, and then we'll I'll jump around.
Well, mine is to just um, really recognize that this is a journey. Uh, and just as being mentioned earlier, it is a we have we have still we still have a long way to go in terms of now ensuring that um we are walking the talk and we are actually modeling the feminist uh principles and values and it's not an easy um or one of um, project based kind of um intervention but rather a kind of a behavior change conscious building as well as um transformative um kind of approach so with this uh we need to understand that uh there are uh, various ways that we can build um or build consensus and solidarity within the movement to ensure that we are um we are positioning ourselves to uh, challenging this opposition and challenging these uh, patriarchal structures that continue to um, perpetuate negative narratives about feminism and also some of the works that we do. So it is um, quite uh, quite a mouth mouthful, but yeah, those are my last remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Um, Bettina? Thank you. Um, so walking the talk, uh, definitely an ongoing everyday challenge. My reflection, a couple of them is, I really believe that the process is as important as the outcome. I do, in my experience, find that power is nestled in the process. And if we can really bring about accountability and transparency in the process, we can then deconstruct and unlock power to shape the outcome. Um, and so that is my everyday ongoing experience, even with those things that Trilata alluded to, whether it's uh, within my leadership team, within the organizational board, whether it's in the organization process, keeping a really strong focus on not just what you know, we are hoping to achieve, but the process we're taking to, to, to walk uh, there. Uh, and, and then I guess just the other uh, mention is self-care. I think that uh, self and collective care is the ongoing challenge of social justice spaces, particularly as organizations are working to bring about change in the world, but as well as in themselves as organization and as in themselves as people. Um, thank you. Thanks, Bettina. Gagan? Uh, thank you. Um... You know, for me, the life experience really has been, uh, and if I just use the nonviolent communication aspect, all men have to see the jackal sitting in them and make really be conscious of that jackal, uh, which comes out, you know, as part of one's upbringing uh, right from ch childhood. But I think, I think to constantly focus that role hierarchies will always be there in organizations. Why are we always converting role hierarchies into relationship hierarchies? Um, and I think that, to me, um, to, if we really believe in, in, in the value of equality, then it's, it's seen in my behavior. Uh, you know, I can talk of values, but unless my behavior is demonstrating my values, it's big talk. So I think that level of coherence uh, of my lived values and my proposed values, I think that contradiction is something I'm always living with and trying to resolve and never reaching there. Um, yeah, that's how I would put it. Thank you. Rudo. Thank you. Um, I will hammer on about um, self-awareness um because <laughs> the self always shows up whether it is the self in the individual or the self in the culture of an organization um but the self always shows up and so sometimes we call it being professional this ignoring of self but actually the self seeps into and leaks into um everything around us so it is we're better off engaging it consciously um because it will show up either way so it's really about understanding what triggers us, what destabilizes us, what upsets us, but what inspires us, what heals us, what grounds us, um, and channeling our energies there. 
Thank you. And I'm going to give Srilata the last word in terms of the wrap up, um, given all of her work on the think piece and extensive experience, I think working across various organizations on, you know, on this process of transformation. So Srilata, before I take back and, and then hand over for closing remarks, thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I think I'd like to start by uh, with the quote that I in fact start the paper with, uh, which is kind of a cautionary tale to all of us. Uh, it's the famous quote from Lao Tse, the ancient Chinese philosopher, and he said this in some, I don't know, 250 uh, before the Christian era. Uh, he said that if you don't change direction, you'll end up where you are heading. And uh, I think it's such a simple but deep, deeply wise statement that if we keep going the way we've been and the kinds of leadership we've been practicing, well, we're going to get exactly what we deserve, yeah? which is a continuous reproduction inside our spaces of the very power structures that we claim we want to change because we are not going to that change at a deep enough level. So the second that follows from that, my second closing comment would be to say, what is all this for? It's actually for a, a very simple home truth. We are telling people that a socially just world is possible, but where are we showing it to them? Where are we showing them what it feels like, what it looks like, what it's like to live in that world. So that's what we have to try and demonstrate inside these spaces, these small spaces, our organizations, our movements, our collectives, which are within our control. If we can't give people even a glimpse within these spaces of what the socially just transformed world is like, why should they believe it's possible for you to create it anywhere else? Simple logic. So finally, I think my last message would be, we've heard so much wisdom today from this panel, a lot of the wisdom of hundreds and thousands of people around the world is somewhere distilled in a some, you know, approximation in the think piece but as we've all seen it is a journey but every journey has to start with a single step so I ask you all to think about as we close today what step are you going to take to begin this journey thanks Johanna back to you Thank you so much, Srilata. And I hope, you know, we're all reflecting on that um, in terms of this larger, longer term process. I think we're never, we ne there's no ending. There's always space for improvement. Um, and yeah, I think a really important takeaway. Now I have, I'm conscious we are running slightly late. Hopefully we have a few more minutes, um, but I really have a the great pleasure and, and honor to introduce uh, Gita Misra, who's the co-founder and executive director of CREA, who's co-hosting uh, co this webinar with us to give the closing remarks. So over to you, Gita. Yeah, it feels like after Srilata, what more could I close with? But let me try three points. Uh, one being who and what needs to transform. And everyone has talked about ourselves are questioning our own biases, privileges, how we practice power in our organizations. But I want to add one more thing. I think we need to become people uh, and feminists that can learn and unlearn every day and agree that we don't know everything. That, and every day we are taught by our colleagues, our communities. I have learned about ableism, from people with disabilities, sex workers work. I've learned from trans people, uh, their struggles. And so that would be one. So I think what we need to transform is uh, our thinking, because if we change the way we think, we will change the way we act. My second point is why does this transformation need urgent attention now? 
I think we, it needs urgent attention because we see this huge global tide of anti-gender, anti-democracy forces. And we need feminist leaders at the helm who understand these interlinkages. They understand how economic inequality, attacks on democracy, bodily autonomy, uh, climate catastrophe are connected and they're able to imagine and think. So we have to counter these very old ways of thinking about feminism and transformation and feminist leadership where the family gets naturalized, who is a woman gets naturalized. So my second point would be that. Uh, and my last point would be, what's the biggest transformation we can hope for? And I think that uh, what we can hope for is a much greater solidarity that can be driven by feminist leadership, but also feminist mentoring. Feminist leaders and movements need to understand how movements are stronger together. Very often we see movements that are uh, identity-based or otherwise we can't have a rhetoric of my suffering is worse than your suffering and that some people need more rights, resources and attention. We need a bigger feminist tent under which anyone can be included, trans people, lesbian, sex workers. And we can't undermine the struggle of any group to advance the rights of their own in the short term. And that is why we need feminists to commit to leadership in different ways of organizations, of movements, but also to commit to principles and ideas of rights of, for all, violence against all people to be prevented. And we really need to think uh, of the constituencies ourselves as change agents, but also changing ourselves at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gita. Um, and thank you everyone once again for joining uh, today, our, our audience, the panelists, um, Sri Lata. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure and the recording is available. So if people would like to listen back as well as um, download Sri Lata's think piece from, the, from our website, please do that. And we look forward to the conversations. Hopefully this is the start um, of future conversations in this space. So thank you.